Hi folks, welcome to this session where we're going to be talking about Confluence and Jira service management and how they can form the ultimate knowledge management duo. But really the backstory is about how this solution supports 12,000 plus colleagues with product and service knowledge who are servicing 16.3 million members. But it's not really my story. I'm just here as the support guy. And so I'll hand you over to Nat to introduce herself. Thank you, Phil. I'm Natalie Shaw and I'm Knowledge Production Manager at Nationwide Building Society. And as I've introduced myself, I work for the Adaptivist Group and I'm here in a support role. So a bit of context about Nationwide. So Nationwide has its origins in the cooperative movement of the 1880s in Britain. And it was actually named Nationwide in 1970 as it merged with over 250 other building societies. And of course, we're a mutual, so we're um, run for the benefit of our members and that mutual status, which means that we don't have any shareholders is something that we're very much committed to preserving. So nowadays, um, we um, provide a range of financial um, products, but we still have our, uh, the core of our business in personal savings and residential mortgages. Um, last year in 2022, around one in seven first-time buyers had their uh, mortgage with Nationwide, and around one in 10 current accounts in the UK are with Nationwide too. So as you'd expect with a big financial services organisation, we are very heavily regulated. And for us in knowledge, that means that everything that we do, uh, there has to be a, an audit trail and extensive documentation. And I think just generally as a, as a whole, the business is um, very risk averse. So knowledge is a relatively recent development at Nationwide. Um, it only began in 2018 and actually it started because the business had taken on a member contact system for telephony and web chat users and social and it just happened that there was a knowledge capability in the box with that. So my team was set up, uh, we called our knowledge database Haynes, and in 2018, we created a content for telephony and web chat colleagues, which we launched in, at the beginning of 2019. And then um, in 2020, we followed that with content for branch users. So we reckon that we've got around 12,000 users um, across nationwide altogether, because there are something like um, 3,000 um, admin center users who also like to refer to the content that we've created. So from the beginning, we had some very distinct principles um, for knowledge at Nationwide. We were very keen that it was gonna be member in rather than business out. So in other words, we went to great lengths to um, elicit the answers to real member questions. Um, and we triangulated those with lots of different sources of, of data. So it's member in rather than business out, which is what the business wants to say about itself. And we have created the answers um, to real member questions that are, are there and ready for consultants to use at, at specific touch points in the member journey. And another key principle is feedback. So we know that there's lots of expertise out there in our um, user base. And if they can comment on the knowledge and send us their thoughts and, and feedback improvements, then that makes the knowledge better for every user. So our stakeholders around the business um, comprise product teams who are designing the financial products, operational teams who process applications and service the, those products, and then of course service teams who are in contact with members. So by 2020, we had some pretty good knowledge foundations at Nationwide, but the landscape was already starting to change a little bit and the pandemic came along and just accelerated that. So as you can imagine, um, our call centers most of the uh, colleagues in those call centres began working from home. And for them, where they've been able to turn to a colleague or a call coach if they um, need to find an answer to a question, there's now obviously a barrier to them doing that. 
Um, and so knowledge becomes more important for them. And then meanwhile, in our branch network, there are around 600 branches, around 7,000 branch colleagues. Obviously, there are changes in footfall caused by the pandemic. And then when the branches reopen, they're um, closed actually past the time because of the change in footfall. And while they're closed, the colleagues in those branches begin to take member calls and member chats. And as you can perhaps appreciate, not, um, Nationwide there with its long history going back 130 odd years, processes have evolved differently in different channels. So there might be one way of doing uh, a process in branch, but that could be very different if you're a tele telephony consultant or a web chat consultant. And of course, then there are digital journeys that have been built much more recently. And so knowledge becomes more and more important to support colleagues who are trying to navigate some of those complexities. So by 2021, we knew that we wanted to make some changes in the knowledge base to better support our users in that kind of change landscape. Um, but our ability to flex and innovate with our current platform was severely limited. So the platform itself was becoming increasingly bespoke in terms of code. The relationship was through a third party, which was making the lines of communication quite complicated. Any change that we wanted to make required new code that might take weeks to develop. And then it would have to go through a series of deployment cycles and overnight testing. I think there were at least three different preview environments before it went to the live um, site. And quite often my um, authoring team might have to get up at four in the morning to test it before it went live. Sometimes it went live and introduced more issues in the live site. And the uh, back end of the system had become quite unstable for authors. So quite frequently, um, they might be building some, you know, they might be a couple of hours into building some complicated content and then find that the system uh, crashed and they'd have to start again. And the platform itself was extremely expensive for the business. So all in all, there was a real feeling that we wanted to move to a new platform that could better adapt to our needs, um, which would be less expensive for the business, but would allow us to innovate for our users. And then we had an opportunity. So the contract with the existing supplier was up at the end of 2021. So that gave us a chance in 2021 to start to look at alternative providers. And the first thing that we did was to draw up a, a set of detailed business requirements. So there were around 200 requirements which set out everything that the current system did and then added in a few items from our wish list. And it's important at this point just to mention that one of the key sort of unique selling points of the current platform was an interactive decision tree. And that really helped our users. So depending on the answers to their questions, the system would triage them to the right bit of content to answer their question. And that was something that our users had got used to and which was very helpful for uh, navigating users through complex nationwide processes. So we were very keen to match that particular requirement. But as I've said, there were lots of others. Um, but we quite quickly found that Confluence met a lot of them straight out of the box. So I'll hand over to Phil to talk a bit more about that. Thanks, Nat. All this was going on, and to an extent, it was outside of our existing engagement and working with the implementation of Atlassian Cloud within Nationwide. In 2021, we did a major migration of Jira, Jira software, that is, Confluence and Jira service management to the Atlassian Cloud. What that gave was an immediate ability to spin up proof of concepts and to scale as required from that. So we did actually spin up three proof of concepts pretty much straight away with that move to Atlassian Cloud. And amongst the POCs was the work for the knowledge management team that were working on Haynes. So by the time we would had these discussions with Adaptivist and with Phil in particular, we knew that we had a strong business case to move to Confluence, which are, was our preferred candidate at that point. We knew it was going to be a big change for the big 
business and um, a high impact one. Um, but we had confidence that the proof of concept had given us that this was the right way to go. And so we were gearing up for that change. And then something really frustrating happened. So um, all of this time in the background, there was a customer relationship uh, program in flight at Nationwide. And the ultimate aim was for this much bigger uh, program to absorb knowledge as one of the use cases for the CRM system. So they were coming along, um, they looked at our business case, but they asked us to extend with our existing provider for another 12 months, which would then allow them to come along and replace knowledge a year later. And so we extended with the existing supplier at great expense, actually. Um, but I had some concerns about whether the CRM could really look at our use case and, and come up with a new system for us within 12 months. So I kept lines of communication open with Phil and the Adaptivist team. And then sure enough, in, in June 2022, um, the CRM programme came back to us and they said, actually, knowledge wasn't going to be one of their first use cases after all. Um, so we reopened negotiations. We started looking at the business case again. And to cut a long story short, I'm pleased to say that by the end of August, our senior leadership team had signed off the decision to move to Confluence for a couple of years. Uh, but that left us with just three months until the existing contact, uh, contract expired at the end of December. So we had just three months to build a brand new platform, migrate around 4,000 articles and launch with our 8,500 frontline users. So we've got our MVP, we got it defined, we knew what we needed to build, we knew it was going to be built with Confluence and the refined front end. And this was built out from the proof of concept, taking it up to the MVP. So with that minimum viable product and compressed timeline, we still had to remember that this was a major overnight change for those eight and a half thousand frontline colleagues. And we really needed to focus on that minimum viable product to make sure they got everything they needed on that changeover date. And all the time I had the little voice in my ear of Natalie telling me, don't forget about the user experience. Don't forget about the user experience. It became a little parrot that sat on my shoulder the whole time through. And so that user experience became even more important due to the lack of time. And we started off knowing that there would be minimal opportunity for end user training. That actually turned out to be more like no opportunity for end user training. And so what we had was we had the story of the migration. We had understood that not all of the requirements were possible in the short time scale. And so we had to carefully focus on what would the MVP deliver. What was the key value that we could deliver in that 12 week period? And we needed to proceed at same speed. For this, we adopted a Kanban approach to looking at all of the requirements and any of the emerging extra requirements to ensure that we delivered those highest value items first. And as you can see here, the timeline was incredibly tight and incredibly condensed. And so that led us to the story of the migration and I'll hand you back to Nat to talk about what they did. So yes, the migration, we had around 4,000 articles that had to be manually cut and pasted from the old system to the new, um, thanks to a few quirks in the, in the code of the old system. So this obviously was a major effort. So we um, basically, we were able to pause um, our BAU pipeline for the team with a few exceptions. And then we just put all of the knowledge authors on the task. And we also had our borrowers. So that's the nickname that we give to our informal secondments from the contact centers. And they come into the team for a few months at a time to help us improve the knowledge content for frontline users. But in this case, the six borrowers that we had at the time were absolutely key in making sure that we could migrate all of the content in time. And it has to be said that Confluence was lovely and easy to use for us. So that kind of learning curve was over in a, in a matter of days, really. Um, and it really helped that um, Confluence was also much more stable and user friendly than our existing platform. Um, so progress was fairly swift. And what we did was we created um, a spreadsheet at really granular level that set out all of those 4,000 content items. 
and uh, the authors could just kind of tick those off um, as they'd migrated the content and then as it was peer reviewed. And that spreadsheet fed into a dashboard um, which we could use to monitor progress and we could see the migration in percentage terms gradually ticking upwards. So that was a really useful tool actually for us to know that migration was on track, but also to keep morale up because this was a fairly intense exercise for everybody to do all of this cutting and pasting and checking over several weeks. So we started migrating the straightforward, what we call flat content, so just text and images. Um, and we were migrating that while we were building the more um, functional parts of the system. And obviously we were working closely with Adaptivist, but we were also collaborating with other teams and specifically with the methods and tools team at Nationwide who administer conference. And they were setting up our spaces and our structure and permissions um, for the new tool. And we were also working closely with Brew Digital who helped us configure the UX and the visual design, because as Phil alluded to earlier, that was gonna be key for our users. And I was very concerned. I always draw the analogy um, of going into the supermarket when they've moved the aisles around and you know what you need is there, but it's difficult and more time consuming to find it. And I was just very keen that our eight and a half thousand frontline users didn't have that experience when we launched a new system at short notice. And I think the migration went pretty smoothly. Obviously, we wouldn't have been probably developing a system and migrating at the same time, ideally. But the only issue that we had was some of the um, decision trees that I talked about earlier, where we found out halfway through building them that we'd been linking to the wrong URL or URL which had changed. Um, and so we knew that we needed to update that. Um, which would have taken a lot of hours out of our schedule. Um, but the Adaptivist team were fantastic. Phil was able to contact somebody to write a script for us that would replace that URL. So that saved us a lot of time and meant that we stayed on track. That staying on track was super important. We were following a Kanban style approach and we were starting to capture feedback as well as we built. So. Not only did we have the requirements that you saw earlier, we now started to capture that feedback and the feedback was being fed into that same Kanban board. And so that was super important. But then came our second curveball. So we'd had a curveball, which was hold fire for a year. Now we had a curveball and we were about two months into the process by this point. We were getting towards the countdown for the final bar push when we were told, oh, by the way, because we're turning off the old system, there are two more sites that need to exist as well. And so we needed to do the new starters and the mortgage operations. Um, at that point, to cut a long story short, I lost my mind, but no, we were able to go back and revisit some of the decisions that had already been taken. Thankfully, all of those decisions were minor changes, if any, to allow us to create those two additional same sites. And that was super important that we were able to support not only the Haynes team, but also the new starters and the mortgage operations team on that key date. So user testing was something that was really important to us. Um, but unfortunately, it was one of the things that had to be compromised because of that very tight timescale. So we did do some individual user testing. And then about halfway through uh, the programme, we um, gave around 200 users in our telephony teams access to the kind of work in progress that we'd built. Um, and this led to a few challenges later on. We'll come back to that later. But we were able to capture some of the user feedback using the new tool that we discovered. And so one of the things which was really important was that capturing of the feedback. And we knew we needed to make sure that people didn't need to context switch. Previously, when they sent feedback, they had to drop out of the tool, go into email, send an email and trigger it that way. And we all know that context swapping leads to a drop in productivity. So what we did was we implemented the JSM gadget on every page so that the users could put their, their feedback literally just by clicking on the button and put, filling in the form. 
So there's no interruption to their productivity. They gave their feedback quick and easily. And more importantly, it was traceable back to them as a user. And so again, we used that through the Kanban board and we captured that. And although the team were only getting, are only now getting 15 items a day, those 15 items can be seen as low, but actually the time to address some of those changes can be quite long. And so we have a Kanban board in JSM now that enables that queue to be managed and updated. And with over 300 items in the backlog, this has made a huge difference to the way of working of the knowledge team. So that Jira service management was, a, was revolutionary for my team and it became much easier to contact the people sending the feedback and easier to manage the work as we progressed it. So the migration had gone really well. And in fact, um, we'd completed the move of those 4,000 articles a little bit early. Um, we'd done the acceptance into service, the comms plan, the incident planning, and we were able to launch uh, the new system on the 6th of December. Um, and we watched the, our users migrate from the old system to the new one via the analytics, um, which was great to see that um, adoption. And it all went fairly smoothly, so much so, in fact, that we were able to turn off the um, previous system mid-December ahead of schedule. Initially, we were seeing about 370 users every minute, but that soon went up to around 700, and we're now seeing peaks of over 1,000. So, yes, we'd got to mid-December, and we'd achieved what we set out to do, which was to build a brand-new system in under three months to migrate all of our existing content and to launch for 8,500 frontline users. And all of this had been done within the time frame and within budget. And this is so unusual at Nationwide that it was actually called out in a CEO report at the board. So after the launch, there were some challenges. One of which was search, and as we know, search can be particularly challenging. So here you can see a screenshot that shows the search for PIN MAM. Actually looking for PIN management, and what you'll see is in the recommended links, PIN management was actually down at the bottom. And whilst Confluence learns what's popular and what isn't, it wasn't populating the search to give the promotion to the top. And so because we had a relationship with Refined and we were working closely with them, we worked with them and they've actually done two feature releases directly from the feedback which we were able to provide. And so now what happens is when you search for PIN management, it is immediately found as the top link in that respect. It doesn't hide the other requests, but it does bring them forward into that top level. And those changes have been able to be done without any interruption, without any necessity for retraining or re rework on the part of Nationwide. And so beyond MVP, where are we going next? Well, myself and Nat are in regular conversations. There's more work on search. There's granular analytics. And there is the future of the decision trees, how to better support navigating complex processes and those interactions with members. And looking at how we do that automated workflow and approvals to make sure that changes are seamless and easily covered. And I'll let Nat do the closing slide. So yes, that's the story of how you can support over 16 million members via around 12,000 colleagues with three instances of compliments manned by just 20 authors in the space of three months. Thank you. And we hope you found this session interesting and we look forward to hearing from any of you. We're all on LinkedIn. Feel free to reach out and join us. Thank you very much. Thank you.